So just to give a couple of more minutes, I noticed that quite a few videos that were on before are turned off. So it could be that people are still arriving. Maybe we can just sit quietly for a couple of minutes together and ground ourselves in our experience of being embodied. And also just sensing that connection that we have to one another. in this virtual but rather sacred space. A place where we come together to practice and grow in the Dhamma. Just feeling your body and gently softening to any sensations you experience, no matter whether they're gross or subtle. Whilst also allowing your body to find some comfort and ease. Sometimes we sit down fairly carelessly and our bodies are asking us to move them. So. Allowing yourself to find the best position for you at this time. And establish an attitude of friendliness to your body and to your mind, including your emotional world. And extending a welcome to yourself in this space where you belong, where you're valued, where hopefully you feel seen. And again, expressing my happiness and appreciation in being asked to facilitate today. It's really lovely to be with a group of dedicated practitioners of so many different backgrounds, genders, races, <laughs> and uh, that's what enriches us as a community. So I'm presuming or hoping that more people are back now. This afternoon we're going to um, broach the subject of non-self and identity, but particularly um, women and women's ordination. And um, don't think that this doesn't apply to you. Even if you are a woman, you might have no aspiration to ordain. It might not be something that's ever occurred to you. If you're, you identify as male or gender non-binary or transgender, whatever gender you identify as, this can relate to you too. It's an example that I'm going to use to just bring across how, hopefully, this doctrine of non-self or anatta, let me keep it as anatta, that the Buddha teaches, um, doesn't mean that we override our individual differences. And of course, this um, is quite nuanced, it's quite subtle, and perhaps not an easy thing to try to explain. But I'll do my best and I want to give plenty of time for you to um, discuss this together in your groups or alone in your journaling, however feels best for you. And uh, aware as well that many of us have not perhaps read the suttas or some of us have more experience in the practice than others, uh, not everybody might understand this um, teaching. I mean, I have to admit that for myself it's still a work in progress and for most of us here, I'm sure, uh, we can think that we grasp something with our intellect, but really the sign of that is how it informs our lives. And um, so this is a deep teaching and not something that, you know, we need to try too hard to understand. But I can give some basic principles that can help you understand whether you're somehow getting closer to the Dhamma that the Buddha taught. So, this word anatta. <laughs> is first of all the opposite of the word atta, which in ancient India meant something like a permanent, essential, 
um, unchanging soul, an essence of what we take ourselves to be. That was the atta. Sometimes we use the word soul in English, but um, the basic uh, qualities are that it's essential and permanent, something that's beyond conditions, if you like, or that's not conditioned. Whereas anatta means the opposite of that. So it means it is actually not permanent or essential to, to this thing we call a self. There's nothing in there that's permanent or essential. And uh, for me, anyway, that immediately makes me feel some relief. <laughs> Again, a little bit like the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. It's like, oh, goodness, I don't have to feel so responsible for this then. You know, it's something arising that I might not have the control over that I think I have. Um, but in all of the Buddha's teachings, he's providing, offering ways of looking, ways of looking at reality, ways of looking at life as a, of ourselves, um, that basically alleviate distress, suffering, uh, dissatisfaction, whatever you want to call that word, dukkha. So if it really is an understanding of non-self, it should alleviate suffering. And in another sutta, um, a teaching that the Buddha gave to the first bhikkhuni, Mahapajapati Gautami, she was his maternal aunt, and also to the barber, Upali, he gave a very similar teaching. He said, you can know that something is the Dhamma if it leads to peace, if it leads to harmony, to insight, to um, deep peace, and to enlightenment. So obviously the opposite of that is that if it's not leading to those things, it could be that we have some misunderstanding there. We're grasping these teachings in an unskillful or not yet um, fully informed way. Yeah. So the doctrine of not-self, anatta, is a profound and very liberating teaching that highlights the conditioned nature of this thing that we refer to as a self. And it's a way of looking that engenders compassion. This is very important, especially when it comes to understanding identity and the way that might manifest. Our intellectual understanding is obviously limited, as I've said, because this is something to be realized. And again, as everything in the Buddha's teachings is, it's a gradual process of uncovering or uprooting our delusions to get closer to the truth of how things are. So I'll talk a bit about what the Buddha meant um, by anatta. And one of the um, passages that I really love, it's from the Samyutta Nikaya, which is, uh, sorry, no, it's from the Nudana Samyutta, which is uh, the part of one of the texts that's focused on causality. So this is kind of the crux of the teaching. And he says, it's not that there's nothing because the arising is seen, However, it's not that there's something. We can't say there's something because the passing away is seen. So we're left in a conundrum. But then he went on to say instead, it's this middle way. It's another definition of the middle way. What we're seeing is a conditioned process of cause and effect, dependently ar arising based on causes and subject to disappearing when those causes are removed. So this thing is not nothing, you know, we can't say we, we don't exist, we can't say it's all empty, unless we use that word emptiness to mean it's dependently arisen, something is arising, that also ceases, and this is a constant process going on. So it doesn't mean that there's nobody there who suffers, you know, if we cut our skin, if we bash our knee, it hurts, you know, no matter who we are. But we misconstrue what's there as something that doesn't deserve the designation self or soul or essence. Yeah, there's nothing permanent, essential or unchanging to be found. So for, furthermore, the Buddha breaks um, down what we take to be a self into five components of existence. These are called the five khandhas in the Pali. And in the Anattalakana Sutta, which is also in the Samyutta Nikaya, and I've given you these references to look through later if you wish, he breaks down our experience of life, our experience of who we are, into five parts. The first one is physical matter, rupa. You know, there's a body here, there's matter. It's something physical. There's also um, feeling that arises dependent on contact. Um, between the body and anything tangible. 
And this is called Vedana. It can be pleasant, painful, or somewhere in between. It's a whole spectrum of um, what is sometimes called the effective tone of experience. So we know whether something's pleasant, painful, or somewhere on that kind of um, uh, that spectrum. Yeah. And obviously, you know, that whenever we experience pleasure, it's likely to lead, more likely to lead to craving and grasping. When we experience something unpleasant, it's more likely to lead to aversion, wanting to get rid of that. Um, and when we experience something fairly neutral, we tend to dull out sometimes. It's a little bit boring for our mind. Um, and then the next one is the perception, how we perceive something. So whatever we feel, we then know that we feel. We perceive it as pleasant or unpleasant. We give it a name or a valuation. And then we react, sankhara. That's the next uh, aspect of the mind. We tend to have a reaction. And this is also our will. You know, it's that um, ability to choose, ability to... Um, usually it's a whole heap of reactivity rather than a response because we're acting out of conditioning, out of habit patterns. And then lastly, consciousness. Yeah, so we have the body, we have feeling, perception, um, mental volition or reactivity, and we have consciousness. And these are the things that basically make up this thing we call a self. So if you think about that, even for a moment, and you try to think of something that doesn't fall into one of those categories, it will be pretty difficult. <laughs> Everything has some kind of form. Even if there's, um, you know, beings who don't have a physically embodied form, still they have mind, you know, and if there's consciousness, then you're going to be percipient of something, um, and there's going to be the pleasure or pain or something in between, and you're going to like it or not, right? So all of these things comprise what we take to be a self. <clears throat> but then the Buddha helps us to get more close to what's meant by this, by looking at the... Um, why it is that we cannot say these things are me or mine. Neither are they my, me, nor do they belong to me. And he says, if it was a self, if any of these things were a self, then they would not lead to affliction. Right? I mean, if it really was a self, then why would we even want it to be a self if it caused so much suffering for us? We wouldn't be clinging to it in any way. The second one is that he says, you know, if it really was a self, if any of these things were who we are, then we would be able to say, may it be this way. You know, may I have only pleasant sensations. May I not have any unpleasant sensations. But because we don't have that control, because these things arise and pass away due to their own causal conditions, we can't say that they're mine. We can't have any control over them. You know, at best we can only influence them in a positive direction. And lastly, he's saying that if it's impermanent, if any of these things are impermanent, how can they be a self? Because they're constantly subject to changing. Yeah? So how can there be a self there? If it's a self, it's something abiding, it's something essential, it's something that we can say will last forever. But actually, everything's arising and passing away, even as we speak. It's not just that we see the arising and later we see the passing. We can actually see that happening very fast when the mindfulness develops. So this is quite deep and it's um, the kind of bare bones of the doctrine, if you like. But I would like to discuss a little bit how we apply this perception or we could apply this perception to our everyday life and also to your role as Dhamma leaders and how you might present the Dhamma. And I think this is especially interesting when it's coming into the realm of identity and gender homosexuality as well, which Bernard is still going to um, cover, I believe, by sending um, a recorded talk on that, um, something he has a lot of experience in. But any kind of identity, whether racial or um, related to your sexuality, whatever it might be, whether you're rich or poor, you have um, what is considered um, normal abilities or different abilities, you know, we all have different abilities from one another whether you particularly identify as smart or not so smart, um, whatever it is, you know, it is the arising of conditions and we can't really say this is me or mine. So one of the implications I think this understanding has, first of all, when we apply it to our everyday life, is that instead of searching 
for who I am. You know, this endless search and sometimes formed as a meditation question, who am I? Instead of doing that, because this implies we are something, a really useful question to ask is what do I take myself to be? What do I take myself to be means what do I identify with here as a self? Does it really deserve that designation? You know, there is something here, but maybe I'm misconstruing what's here to be essential when actually it's conditioned. And for me, this is very effective, a very effective um, perception and insight that allows me to loosen the grip on what I take to be me. You know, it stops us from over-identifying with our experience. It's not that we push it away or say that it's irrelevant, but sometimes we can get too um, restricted around our identities, too fixed, in a way that leads to more suffering. So instead we learn to hold our individual um, identity, perhaps, or the way we perceive ourselves with a little bit more fluidity and softness, you know, because this process, that's arising now is constantly in a flux, it's in a flow. And I think this very much leads to the possibility of, you know, things like a person being born and identifying as a particular gender physiologically and later on questioning that gender identity, um, which is, you know, actually very natural, in my opinion, due to this... Um, you know, this understanding of non-self and the fact that things change. Um, and also that whatever we're experiencing, whatever we're observing also in another, the way they manifest, is just a play of conditions. What we're seeing is not a person, we're not seeing a final product um, or anything essential there, but we're seeing the sum total of all the causes and effects and conditions and experiences that person has had in their life uh, manifesting now in a particular form, a particular set of emotional, physical, mental patterns. And we're not trying to fix ourselves. If there's no self, if there's nothing but a set of conditions that's constantly in a flow, then what are we trying to fix or improve? You know, some, some of us come to the Dhamma, I'm sure I did too in the beginning, feeling that, you know, perhaps I could improve myself. There were parts of me that were deficient, there were parts of me I couldn't accept, or that maybe weren't accepted to the society or my parents, you know, not fulfilling their expectations in some way. And so I thought I can be a better person if I practice the Dhamma. And over the years I've realized that's not the point of the Dhamma. We're not trying to improve or fix ourselves because there's actually nothing wrong. How can you say that there's something wrong with a set of conditions that have arisen due to causes. They're, this is a natural phenomena. And I think here our work starts to shift from, you know, trying to change this thing that's out of control to working skillfully with the conditions that arise at any given time. And they can be internal conditions and external conditions that are working on us. And when we can actually relate to other people that way, I think it gives rise to a lot more compassion and also a sense of non-judgment. You know, not fixing a person in a particular way or judging them and feeling they should be or could be any different than they are, but realizing that perhaps if we'd had a very, very similar background, if we were of the same biological makeup, you know, um, if we'd had the exposure that that person had had to specific events or or people, you know, influences on them, it may very well we'd be just the same. Yeah. In fact, I can't see it any other way. So this is one of the benefits of understanding that, you know, basically the, the arising is seen, but it also disappears. Things can change. Things can, um, can manifest in different ways, even throughout a single lifetime. And then... You know, another thing that I've heard often said in uh, Dhamma circles, rather glibly perhaps, is that, well, you know, if there's no self, then what's the point of gender? You know, if, if there's no self, then, and the mind is essentially without gender, then what is the relevance of gender? What is the relevance of sexuality? What is the relevance of race? You can extend this to everything. And, you know, the relevance in this context, is that that is one of the conditions that we're working with. <laughs> Gender is also a condition, right? 
it's produced by a cause and it has certain implications, certain consequences for the way we experience the world. You know, we have our obviously things that happen to us based on how we're perceived by society, whether um, our particular identity is accepted by mainstream society or marginalised, will give us a very different experience of life, of the way others relate to us, perhaps of opportunities as well, the access that we might have. Um, but also internally, you know, if we're um, brought up or socialised as, as women, um, it can be deeply ingrained to believe we're less credible than men, you know. It's been shown <laughs> in gender studies that uh, women's voices or, or what women, you know, maybe come up with as a result of a lot of um, expertise in a particular field is often seen as less credible than that of men. And it's uh, another very well-known fact that an overqualified woman might not get the job, but a, a man who is less qualified may. <laughs> just because of our biases, societal biases, and they can become internalized, you know, so that they can lead to a lack of self-confidence. And again, this is a vicious circle because that lack of confidence will also feed into that lack of credibility. We might show up um, less empowered or less sure of ourselves than other people will. And of course, this can extend even more so perhaps to more marginalized communities too. So I think as a a community Dhamma leader or a Dhamma teacher or just a good, compassionate, conscientious human being um, who cares about the well-being and happiness of everyone around us, part of that care, part of that um, ability to serve is being sensitive to the particular conditions that a person is working with or the conditions that are working on this person, yeah, in whatever way that might mean. And of course, that doesn't mean that we always understand. It's important to realize, I think, that we can't really get inside the world of another, but we can try and empathize to the best of our ability. And we can extend a welcome and extend our respect. So this is where, you know, we, the arising is seen, right? <laughs> We said you can't say there's nothing because the arising is seen. So we do work with the conditions that manifest. It's not a reason to bypass. And I think there's a great danger here in conflating um, the relative truth or say, yeah, relative truth with ultimate truth. Ultimately, we can say there's no abiding entity here. But relatively, we do show up in different ways and have very different um, circumstances to work with. So, you know, the Buddha's path is all about experiencing what's arising presently at this time and not bypassing things that have consequences, especially consequences that cause us to suffer, um, in order to have a, a kind of premature understanding of the deeper truth. So again, this is a process, right? Um, some of the consequences that uh, I experience as a female, especially in monastic life, is that I simply don't have the access to conducive conditions to practice that I would if I were a monk, right? And this can lead to feeling incredibly isolated and unseen, you know, that um, people can't see the struggles that um, women in monastic life might have. What, that, what we might present with is a lot of tiredness, maybe some frustration, maybe some dejection and a struggle to actually maintain ourselves physically as well. Um, and if one doesn't understand the challenges that we face, that can easily create um, a lot of judgment from others and also um, a painful sense of self, you know, that no matter what I do, it's never good enough, it's never seen, etc. And, you know, it doesn't have the same uh, effect that it would if I were a monk. So this is one of the things that um, I can speak from, from direct experience. You know, it's almost as though when there is discrimination or bias working on us, um, whether racism, sexism, transgenderism, I don't know if that's actually a word, but I'm sure it exists. Um, the law of cause and effect doesn't play out quite the way you expect. <laughs> 
you know, if everything is equal and fair, then a certain amount of work should lead to a certain amount of, say, money, or if you're working in the world, or respect, or credibility. But when we're working in a field of bias, and there's bias in every aspect of life, um, that is another factor that skews that whole relationship to some extent. So this is not to be um, too dismal about, because there's also a very positive aspect to that, and I want to talk about this next. Um, which is that having some kind of insight into specific forms of suffering can actually lead to more compassion. And this is, you know, really pointing to the first two factors of the Eightfold Path. The first factor, again, is, to, um, is the Four Noble Truths, right? Right view. Right view includes the Four Noble Truths, some insight into suffering. And a consequence of that insight into suffering, realizing that all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain and, um, you know, deserve that happiness as anyone else. Um, a consequence of that is that we start to take a lot more care and concern about our actions, about our behaviors and the impact of those behaviors on others, not only where we're coming from, but also how it impacts one another as well. And this is called the three right intentions, which I spoke about earlier as a way to meet that suffering. But we can also speak about those three right intentions as ways to um, uh, address inequality to some extent. So for example, compassion is one of those three motivations. Compassion essentially means non-violence. And discrimination is a kind of violence, you know, a lack of... Um, being included or being othered is a kind of violence. It's harmful, it hurts, you know, being stigmatized, for example. So instead of that, we try to understand through compassion how another person might feel. And compassion is very different from pity as well. Again, it's related to understanding cause and effect. That, you know, had we been in a similar circumstance, we might feel just the same. We might make the same choices. Sometimes people make really unskillful choices and we think we could do better, but perhaps they didn't have access to wisdom teachings. Perhaps they weren't around wise friends and that was the best they could do at that time. That was the best that we could do at that time in our life with what we knew. Another um, of these insights that leads to metta, right? Leads to a feeling of self-love when we realize that whatever's arising is conditioned and it has its own unique flavor of suffering and challenge, if you like, then we can have more self-compassion, more self-love, and also try to make efforts to be more inclusive in our Dharma communities. That's one of the things that um, it's been a great lesson for me because, you know, starting a monastery and experiencing a lot of marginalization, a lot of discrimination that still, unfortunately, um, exists in the monastic institutions that we have um, has led me to feel very a lot more empathy to other marginalized communities and more determination not to re replicate those systems of uh, discrimination and exclusion and you know and a willingness to learn because as I said we cannot possibly understand another person's experience we're not in their shoes um, of course, if we do relate on the basis of gender or race, then there can be some more empathy and support there. But uh, a lot of the time we can only um, try to imagine and try to learn, try to find out for ourselves how it may be for another and really extend a sense of um, non-judgment, uh, giving the benefit of the doubt. I think this is a really beautiful attitude, giving the benefit of the doubt. Okay, this person's experience seems strange. Are they exaggerating it? Maybe not, you know, maybe not. What if I take them at their word? What if I understand there are microaggressions in the workplace? <laughs> you know, quite likely, right, because of implicit bias. Then we can get, extend the feeling of safety to that person, even though we don't really understand. And lastly, this idea of acceptance, making peace, the last of the three right intentions, is that we don't deny or reject aspects of ourselves or other people. We accept, we embrace the way things are. And we try to understand. 
And lastly, I think it's important to recognise that the Buddha did adapt his teachings, not the fundamentals, for example, the Four Noble Truths, the Eight Four Noble Path, but he definitely applied these teachings um, in ways that were suitable to the individual, suitable and also sensitive to their particular concerns. Yeah, so this is something we need to do and constantly learn with as community Dhamma leaders or teachers of the Dhamma or even just as spiritual friends, you know, being open to learning, being receptive, listening um, and having a sense of humility as well. Lastly, and leading into women's ordination, because uh, I did want to make this a bit briefer today, um, one of the things I've heard sometimes, again, is this uh, wrong grasp of non-self that leads to saying, well, you know, if it's all non-self, then gender is irrelevant. And that is quite a hypocritical attitude when it comes, again, to exclusion, because you can say it's irrelevant to a point, but in my case, not when it comes to opportunities to ordain. You know, often you'll see, and I'm not sure about this group, it might be quite well balanced, but often in Dhamma centres, 60 to 70 percent of retreatants are female or identify as female. And yet, when you come to a monastery, there are hundreds and thousands, probably tens and hundreds of thousands of monasteries around the world for men. I think in England there are about at least five or so training monasteries for men and no opportunities for women to take full ordination yet. I'm the only fully ordained nun. So there is still a lot of uh, discrimination in Buddhism as an institution, monastic Buddhism in particular, which is the total opposite of the Buddha's intention. So I shouldn't really use the word still, because actually there never used to be. And uh, I can give a little bit of history on that, because I think this is an important uh, situation to be aware of when you're living in the UK and, and, you know, outside a Buddhist culture, even within a Buddhist culture, where there's still a lot of discrimination as well. So when the Buddha became enlightened, he obviously started ordaining monks. And I think the first people that sort of took refuge as monastics under him were his five friends that had been with him on his journey so far. But also, when he was um, enlightened, he actually made a very strong intention, fairly quickly, that he wouldn't pass away to Parinibbana. He wouldn't attain full liberation until what he called the fourfold assembly was strong. And the fourfold assembly included the monastic community of monks and nuns, laymen and laywomen too. And this was a way of framing the society that included everybody. There were, of course, genderqueer folks at that time, and it's unclear, there's been some research on this, as to how far they were included in the monastic sangha. But my understanding is that this was an umbrella term that allowed every human being to access their own potential as fully awakened beings. And not only that, but it was a kind of structure that allowed the Dhamma to become very strong. So it was a container that allowed the teachings to last. And apparently, if you believe in any of this, but in some of the stories in the text, it says that previous Buddhas didn't have that um, fourfold assembly quite so strong. There wasn't as much of a formulated Vinaya code for the monks and nuns. And as a result of that, the teachings didn't last as long. So when we're talking about, you know, ordination and creating opportunities, we're not just talking about making another monastery, like making another hotel. <laughs> We're actually talking about strengthening a system that ensures the strength and longevity and depth of the Dhamma teachings for a long, long time. And he said further that he wouldn't pass away not only until these four limbs were established, but until they were strong and until there were enlightened people in each and every group, enlightened monks and nuns, uh, who were capable of teaching the Dhamma and who were well learned as well, who were very, very strong in sila. This is really the key. We have to actually live the teachings in order for them to take root. So what actually happened here between that time and now is uh, a little bit of a myth, 
But mythology can create barriers if we believe in that without investigation. So one of the myths, first of all, is that the Buddha didn't actually want nuns in the fourfold assembly. He didn't want um, to give full ordination to women. But the reality, as we can see here, is that he actually proclaimed that he wouldn't even attain final enlightenment until that fourfold assembly was strong. And so it's quite likely that his initial reluctance to ordain his um, maternal aunt, Mahapajapati Gautami, was because of concern for their safety in a culture that was very patriarchal and actually very dangerous. Women were um, at risk, in risk of rape, especially with the monastic lifestyle, living in the forest and such. Other people, scholars have said that that was likely added in later and made a little bit too much of. <laughs> because sometimes people have an agenda, right, to keep another group out. One of the other things that was, uh, is working on this whole issue with reinstating full ordination for women is this idea that it died out. There were no more fully ordained nuns um, about a thousand years ago. So we had them in most Buddhist cultures until about a thousand years. And this is an institutionalized myth that's referred to by people who are not incentivized to investigate further. It's a view, and it's a view of self, right? It's a view of self, because having a view that excludes others on the basis of an identity is also, you know, in a way, elevating that identity beyond the basic kind of um, fact of their humanity and their capacity to awaken. So the Buddha was always way ahead of his time in this regard, and even though there were circumstances working upon him in ancient India that made it difficult for women to live as ascetics, still he established that order very, very strong, and there were many um, enlightened nuns. Another thing that's interesting, and I'd like to share, so that you don't have to read through all the documents that I gave you, is that a lot of the um, modern-day argument about whether or not there can be fully uh, ordained nuns, is one passage, a legalistic little passage in the Vinaya. Just a very small, nitpicky point, where after ordaining monks, the Buddha said, and agreeing to ordain nuns, he said, monks, I allow you to ordain nuns. Okay, monks, I allow you to ordain nuns. Sounds all right. Later on, <laughs> Um, there were nuns, and the nuns became senior, and sometimes they didn't really want to answer very personal questions required of them in the ordination. So then he said, nuns, I allow you to ordain nuns, right? Now, one of the problems here is that people who don't want to see the Bakuni order revive say that the second rule rescinds the first. So first he said, monks, you can ordain nuns. Second, he said, nuns, you can ordain nuns. And because he said, nuns, you can ordain nuns, the first one doesn't any longer apply. So this is made use of by people who say, we can't reinstate the Bakuni order because there aren't any more nuns. But the reality is that both of those um, possibilities were left in the texts. You know, and considering that the Buddha had a very strong intention always, not only to give opportunities to women, but to really abolish even the idea of caste, right? To, to allow all people to have access to the Dhamma. I mean, not even allow, because it wasn't his prerogative. Nobody can own the Dhamma. So it's most likely that the Buddha laid both of those rules down precisely because he knew that the time may come when the monk Sangha might die out, the non Sangha might die out, and to be sure that there'd always be a way to continue, he left both of those in. So it's this little nitpicky point that is actually still working around the world to prevent women having the opportunity to ordain. This is what we could call a fixed view or an unwillingness to, um, to investigate. But even so, even if you know only nuns can ordain nuns, we found a way around this because in the Mahayana tradition, um, it's not very different from Theravada. Theravada and Mahayana are kind of slightly different angles on the teaching and they have different uh, cultural associations, you know, they're developed in different parts of the Buddhist world. But essentially the Vinaya, the way that the ordination ceremony is um, conducted, is exactly the same in both. It's from the Dhamma Guptaka tradition. So what actually happened when um, 
we started to have the bhikkhuni ordination happen again was that Mahayana nuns gave the ordination to Theravada nuns using exactly the same procedures that were accepted there. And the first ones were in 1988. It's not very long ago, even though many of you are younger than me, that's really not very long ago. And uh, that was with the Fukuan Shan um, organization, which is a Mahayana branch. And Aya Kemar, who's a very famous um, German bhikkhuni, she was ordained in that, at that time in 1988. So this is incredibly new, considering that the Buddha had it there in 2,600 years ago. And then the next ones were in 1996, and I'll go through this quite fast. This was performed by Sri Lankan monks and some South Korean nuns, and also the Sakyadita organization, which supports bhikkhunis. And this basically reinstated the ordination for fully ordained nuns for bhikkhunis in Sri Lanka. And Aya Kusama, a famous Sri Lankan nun who passed away a couple of years ago, was ordained at that time. And then the bit that uh, directly led to my own ordination is that in 2009, um, in the Thai forest tradition, or let's say the lineage going back to Wat Papong, um, because there are many Thai forest traditions, you know, anyone in Thailand who lives in the forest, is in the Thai forest tradition, you could say. But in uh, the Wat Papong uh, lineage, my teacher Ajahn Brahm um, decided to um, basically confirm some of the bhikkhuni ordinations for women. So four women in Perth uh, spoke to Ajahn Brahm about their wish to take the full ordination. And I think one of the things with discrimination is that sometimes we don't realize its impact until we hear from the people who are suffering. And because he was very open to hearing their experience, he realized the importance of it. And he had the knowledge in order to know that it was quite possible to do the ordination. So he didn't actually ordain them, but he confirmed the ordination. He was the chanting teacher at the ordination. And as a result of that, he was basically called to Thailand, um, wrapped on the, no on the knuckles, <laughs> not literally, but yeah, told off and asked to recant. So he was asked three times to basically deny that ordination invalid. And he didn't do it because his compassion, his understanding and his understanding of non-self gave him the courage and wisdom to stand by what was right. So his understanding of non-self didn't say, okay, the, what does it matter? You know, there's no gender, these women, why should they need it? No, it's, if there's no gender, then why um, obstruct those women seeking the path that the Buddha laid down and said was a very powerful vehicle to liberation. So he um, was actually delisted from that organization after his association with them for 35 years. But, uh, you know, he was willing to make that sacrifice. So this is also a strength that the understanding of non-self can give to us. You know, he lost his community, right? His community. We identify with our gang. But in this case, you know, the Dhamma gave him the courage to actually choose what was right, even at personal loss to himself. And being rejected in a sense. So I think if, you know, if we really experience non-self, it gives us unbounded amounts of compassion. You know, compassion really knows no bounds. And we don't really limit ourselves, we don't limit other people, especially from access to the Dhamma that liberates. And I know for myself, the more that I practice the Dhamma, the more I want to share the practice and my understanding and keep practicing and deepening that understanding with all beings, no matter who they are. And yes, sometimes perhaps it can be intimidating to approach different situations or people that we maybe don't initially identify with as being like us. But, you know, to extend that welcome, to recognize if somebody might be feeling a little left out or unseen or maybe some of the references we use aren't culturally appropriate or inclusive enough, and to um, try to bring them in. Because the Dhamma is for everybody and it can be applied in so many different ways. So now I have this opportunity as the only fully ordained nun in England to do something in, in order to try and create better conditions for other women. And again, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's very difficult to be isolated here um, without a monastic sangha around. 
and to have no one who really understands um, the obstacles and challenges involved. But that does I mean, one of the things is that compassion motivates me very much in that because I don't want other people to go through such a difficult time. And, um, you know, I want to make it easier for women coming later. And also this feeling that I want the community to be, and I will work very hard for the community to be inclusive. Um, and it makes me extremely happy when we have, you know, transgender guests staying and they feel safe here or, you know, members of all different races, you know, people of all different races and sexual orientations, and they feel at ease because to some extent, you know, we can talk about this, we can talk about um, how to make a more inclusive community and how it feels to be marginalised. So a lot of the time we can, you know, understand that Dhamma is universal, but the conditions we have to practice are very different. So I think this understanding of non-self, you know, understanding that you can't say there's nothing because the rising is seen. This means we do tend to the specifics of the situations and conditions we find ourselves in. But you can't say there's something because passing is seen. So we don't hold on to those conditions so tightly. We don't over-identify with the situation we're in. And that can free us up to act from our hearts with what we know is right, not only for ourselves, but for all beings.